Welcome to worship with South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church. Our prelude for today was prepared for and aired for Epiphany Sunday when we celebrated that people were led to worship Jesus, the light of the world. I wanted to bring this music back today because we're marking Transfiguration Sunday when Jesus was seen to shine brightly. I also know that the musicians, Debbie and Lewis, are connecting to our worship live streaming today, so welcome. This coming Wednesday, we start the season of Lent by marking Ash Wednesday with a special service here at 6 p.m. on this Facebook page. We'll deliver ashes to those of you who register for that, but you can easily get a pinch of ashes off of a used candle, once it's cooled, of course, 
If Lent is preparation for marking the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then today is preparation for Lent. The Bible story for today gives us hope and assurance that God will bless and strengthen our hearts for following him during tough times. Often that blessing comes to us through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, and we will celebrate that today, mostly led by seminary intern Heather Thumb Gerber. To participate during live streaming, you'll need a sip of juice or wine at hand and a bit of cracker or bread. Won't you please join me now in asking God's blessing on these elements, as well as the ones that you will use where you are. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another until we feast with him and feast with all your saints in the eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever, amen. Beth Metzger has prepared a message for the children that will help us all continue in today's themes of humility and hope as disciples. Good morning. What do you see behind me? That's right. It's a bunch of signs that you might see on roads all over the place. So tell me, were you born knowing what these signs meant? Of course not. Like lots of other things, you had to learn about them. Sometimes learning about new things comes easily to us. Other times, it takes longer for us to understand. Everybody learns differently, and that's okay. Jesus understood that too, that everybody learns differently. When his disciples didn't quite understand something right away, he continued to teach them with patience and kindness. By doing this, he was demonstrating how God wants us to treat each other. The next time people don't quite understand what you're telling them, think about how Jesus taught his disciples with patience and kindness. It can work for you too. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for Jesus. Help us to remember tr to treat others with patience and kindness. Amen. Join me in the spirit of our prayer of illumination. God of shining splendor, grant us your spirit so that we may hear your word and live as faithful disciples and covenant people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and then led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they took, looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Bless your heart. If someone says that to you directly, it's a positive thing. It's meant to convey sympathy. It's a way of saying, I can see what you're experiencing. 
Bless your heart, those flu symptoms you have sound pretty bad. Bless your heart, preparation for that exam is stressful, isn't it? Bless your heart, you are stretched so thin between caring for your kids and your parents too. I don't know whether people say bless your heart in the North. It seems more of a regional Southern thing. The expression sounds much less supportive though when two persons are talking about someone else, someone who's not in the conversation. Bless her heart, she really struggled to express herself. Bless his heart, I guess he thought that outfit was right for the occasion. In this way, the person speaking takes on a kind of superior tone or a pitying attitude. Well, the author of the Gospel of Mark wasn't from the American South. And he didn't literally say about the disciples, bless their hearts in so many words. But that's what he meant. A few examples, paraphrasing, of course. The disciples saw Jesus miraculously feed thousands of people, but when he calmed a storm for them, they acted like they didn't even know he had power, bless their hearts. When Jesus told them to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, the disciples thought he was chiding them for not bringing bread, bless their hearts. James and John imagined Jesus reigning in glory and imagined themselves sitting on his right and on his left, bless their hearts. Well, you see how that's not very affirming. There are a couple of reasons that Mark depicts the disciples in that way. And I'm going to talk about that, but I'm going to save that for Easter Sunday. Mark had a plan about how he wanted all of his readers to react to the news of Jesus' resurrection. For today, though, I want to say that I can't really go along with Mark when it comes to the story about the transfiguration. I can't feel the least bit superior to Peter when he said, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Oh, maybe someone could put on that Southern attitude and say, bless his heart, Peter interrupted Elijah, Moses, and Jesus to suggest setting up camp. But even Mark, cuts him some slack, explaining Peter did not know what to say because Peter, James, and John were terrified. Well, many a sermon has been written about how Peter wanted to stay on that mountaintop. Since in a later story, Peter tries to get Jesus to stop talking about his destiny of suffering, it's easy to see Peter here as just trying to avoid something. But couldn't God have provided Peter, James, and John that mountaintop experience to encourage them, to give them a precious moment to remember when things would get rough? To be sure, the transfiguration was informational, not just inspirational. It was to help them see and understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, the law and the prophets symbolized by Moses, the great giver of the law, and uh, Elijah, the most famous of the prophets. And it was to help them see Jesus sharing his fate with the other martyrs of Judaism, wearing a white robe garment associated with martyrdom. But couldn't God have also wanted them to have an experience of encouragement and glory and speechless worship for another reason? Couldn't it have been to help them get through all of the hard work and the suffering and the trauma that was to come? Maybe it's the pandemic, but I find myself identifying with Jesus's inner group of followers more than ever before this year. Their normal lives were turned upside down and accompanying Jesus was intense. 
I don't want to second guess their reactions to all of that any more than I want to second guess any of our responses to life during the pandemic. People who get their first COVID vaccination are often very emotional about it. There's a sort of joy and relief. One wants to do the Snoopy dance, thank God, hug the health workers, take a selfie and post it all at once. But at the same time, as hope dawns, it, it dawns in a way that makes the newly vaccinated folks feel just how dense a cloud has been hovering over that hope for months. One thinks about the precious people lost who didn't get this help. One thinks about still living loved ones and how much you want them to get their shots, how much greater your joy would be if you could celebrate their vaccinations too. You wanna to help get everyone vaccinated, no later than 4.30 p.m. today when the health department closes. Well, that's what every day was like living with Jesus, and it was intense. People with every kind of malady came to him for forgiveness and for healing. People suffering every kind of oppression came to him looking for help. People who had lived without hope were seeing it dawn for the first time, perhaps in their whole lives. The disciples couldn't get enough of that, even though sometimes it was nerve wracking and exhausting. They wanted to know how to help. They wanted the reign of God and all the joy that came with it, no later than 4.30 p.m. today. They couldn't have been wholly deaf to the undercurrent of conflict. They couldn't have missed the sideways glances, the conspiratorial huddles, the trick questions of Jesus's enemies. Who can blame them for hoping that there might be a way to meet their 4.30 p.m. deadline without all that suffering and conflict, without having to walk with Jesus through some of the darkest behaviors that human beings are capable of? And isn't it possible that God let the core group on that mountain that day have an experience that they could use to refuel themselves every day from then on? when the going got tougher. That's what we all do. And Valentine's Day is a reminder of that, sometimes a joyous reminder and sometimes a deeply poignant reminder. The reminder of love's high points, love's mountaintop experiences, help us through the tough times. Out come the photos from childbirth and uh, from childhood, from courtship, from weddings, anniversaries, and our hearts are refueled, our hearts are blessed by feeling again what it felt like on this or that carefree, carefree day. Maybe a song brings back one of those mountaintop experiences for you. Maybe the almost palpable feeling of a parent who held your cheeks and gazed into your eyes with love. We know we can't make it last, but we can be strengthened in that moment. God can bless us with encouragement. God doesn't speak about us in the third person and say, there they go needing a boost, bless their hearts. No, God speaks directly to us with compassion and says, I'm going to bless your heart. And how do we know that? Because of Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. That night, the night before he died, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. He invited everyone, even the one who meant to betray him so that we would know we are all welcome. And he said, whenever you do this, 
whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In other words, he expected us to return again and again to this sublime experience of strengthening and hope. It's an experience not unlike the transfiguration with its white robes of martyrdom that celebrates love without denying the reality of suffering. God knows we aren't any greater at following Jesus than the original disciples were. Far from it. But in this meal at the Lord's table, we know we're forgiven and we can experience a communion as sublime as that mountaintop experience was. Maybe you've noticed that the communion service begins with the request, lift up your hearts, followed by everyone replying, we lift them to the Lord. When you lift your heart, it's so that God can bless your heart. You have come to receive God's love. Bless your hearts. Bless our hearts, O oh God. join me in the communion liturgy. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give thanks for God's creation. We give thanks that we are made in God's image. We give thanks because God never gave up on us, even when we were not faithful to God. We remember Jesus who came to live among us as one of us who knew both joy and sorrow. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, broke bread with outcasts and sinners. Dying on the cross, Jesus gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the dead, Jesus gives us new life. Jesus took the bread blessed it, and gave it to his friends, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. And Jesus gave them the cup as the promise that our sins are forgiven. Jesus said, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless 
may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in Christ's name. As this bread is Christ's body for us, may it nourish us to be the body of Christ in the world, responding to the cries of everyone who is suffering in any way and witnessing to God's hope and love. Amen. Let us say together the prayer that the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you fed us in the sacrament, united us with Christ, given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet and your eternal kingdom. In the power of your spirit, may we live ever to please you for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go forth in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faith-hearted. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless and keep you, be kind and gracious to you, look upon you with favor, and give you peace. Amen.